Um, it is an honor to be asked by the fellows of the Academy to speak about someone who has been held in such high esteem and even higher affection by everyone here this morning, particularly in the presence of his daughter and son-in-law. For there will be many here today who I know that, like me, will have experienced his influence in their own personal life as well as in their professional thinking over a wide variety of situations. I worked most closely with Derek at London Business School for only three years in the early 1970s, but we retain our personal friendship over the succeeding 40 odd years. Just over two years ago, we both attended our friend John Child's investiture as an honorary doctorate of Aston University. After the ceremony, we stood in line with Aston faculty colleagues on a very cold March day to raise our caps to all the new young graduates as they streamed out of Birmingham Old Town Hall. We both sucked hard on fishermen friend lozenges in a vain endeavor to retain bodily heat in the cutting March wind that blew across Victoria Square. We walked back towards New Street Station for Derek to begin a long and difficult journey back home to his sheltered apartment in North London. I reflected on the fierce loyalty that he had maintained towards personal colleagues and former partners in his several professional projects. Derek's preference for personal and local communal ties seems also to have extended to his roles within professional associations. These included his formative role in the uh, Association of Teachers of Management and more latterly, of course, in his contributions to the British Academy of Management not least to their doctoral programs. I later checked with close colleagues, in fact, Bob Hynings and Bill Starbuck, and found that they had held the same impression of Derek's attachment to long-term personal and local relationships. In spite of the wealth of international recognition and honors bestowed on him, including, of course, by BAM, Derek seems rarely to have attended overseas conferences except by invitation. Neither did he seek high office in the associations in which his early research work was most recognized, namely the American Academy of Management and the European Group on Organization Studies. Instead, most often than not, many of the world's leading management and organizational scholars seem to have traveled to meet Derek on his home territory rather than he to meet them on theirs. In his later career, he evidently took part in several European and Asian collaborative projects. But in general, he seems to have preferred to do so on the same basis that he used in establishing relationships with the uh, former early Aston team. This was by recognizing a personal and comp uh, affinity and complementary skills in those with whom he had chosen to work. This personal approach might seem to contrast with the cosmopolitan universalism of his scholarly ambition. In his autobiographical essay of 1996, he claims to have always displayed a taste for innovation. But much more of his scholarly writing might be seen to be pursuing the creation of a consistent body of knowledge. This he saw to be necessary in justifying a professional claim for an autonomous field of management, teaching, and scholarship. Mostly he pursued this goal near to, to his desk, but always close to Natalie, his wife and life partner. From there, he produced not only a stream of original research, but he also collaborated in field-defining collections of work by other management thinkers. 
his novitiate guides to the pursuit of knowledge for doctoral entrance, written with Estelle Phillips, could also be seen as providing boundaries for an emergent field of management scholarship. In 1961, Derek was fortunate in being provided with both the authority and the finance of a government grant to pursue this dream. His newly arrived departmental head at Birmingham later Aston College of Advanced Technology, Tom Lupton, passed on these resources to him in the form of a senior fellowship managing the Industrial Administration Research Unit. The possibility of a contingency paradigm of organizational structure seems to have emerged as an integrating research frame for this focused program after nearly a year of extensive literature research and discussion. This can be seen to have covered much of what John Eldridge said shortly afterwards was a golden age in post-war British industrial sociology, that is to say the 1950s. Initially with Lupton, Derek recruited brilliant collaborators whose disciplinary skills complemented his own. Preeminently, these were those of David Hickson and Bob Hynings, and later to be found in Diana Fazy, Kerr Inkson, Roy Payne, and John Child. Early on, he was able to draw on the methodological contributions of Philip Levy at the University of Birmingham. Over the next 20 years, there were to be what Derek describes as four generations of research fellows and associates engaged in extensions to the Aston program. They, and latterly me, gained both knowledge and reputation as they passed through his guiding influence, often on their way to academic achievement elsewhere. What is striking in these several accounts of the birth and development of the Aston program is not only the scope of ambition contained in the project, but also of Derek's early recognition of the need for a main publishing vehicle for the diffusion of its findings. This took the form of a series of articles like Diaries on the Progress in Methods and Findings that were published in the Cornell-based Administrative Science Quarterly. At first, these were all published under the joint authorship of the group, with Derek's name last. ASQ had already printed early American work on the contingent structuring of organizations. The debates promoted in its pages, primarily by editor Bill Starbuck, brought the Aston measures to the center of these debates and claimed the attention of a wide North American and global audience. It also helped make ASQ the place to be in this new field. Not, however, so much that of management, but rather of organization theory. In the late 1970s, I occupied an office four floors above the legendary cellar under the Birmingham furniture store in which the earliest versions of the Aston organization model were first conceived. I never descended the stairs to verify either the reported spatial dimensions or the effectiveness of its lighting through glazed apertures in the outside pavement. My first remembered encounter with Derek had been earlier in 1968, when he and John Child arrived at London Business School, both having just left the site of their earlier research at Aston. Of course, by then, I owned a well-worn copy of Hickson and Pugh's Writers on Organizations. It had already helped me through a number of examinations. At about this time, John and I, with Mark and Warner, had initiated the Industrial Sociology Group of the British Sociological Association. It was located in my lecturer's office in the Department of Industrial Relations at the LSE. Soon after that, I was invited to teach part-time on the Sloan Executive Program at the LBS. Then it was located in Northumberland Avenue, only the length of the Strand away from the LSE. When LBS moved to its new premises in Regent's Park in, in 1970, I moved with it as a lecturer in organization behavior. 
My recollection of LBS teaching and of my relatively marginal participation in Derek's research group over the next three years is, as Derek's autobiography biography suggests, conducted within an atmosphere of some intellectual turbulence. The full-time researchers were housed in physical isolation across the rear yard of Sussex Place in what Derek describes as a Georgian slum. By contrast, the OB lecturing staff, at first Dean Berry, Charles Handy, Dennis Pym and myself, and later joined by Andrew Pettigrew, Tommy Wilson um, and Stuart Templey, worked in the comparative luxury of the main building. But we quite often departed, at least I did, from it bleary-eyed in the late evening to catch the last scheduled train home. The turbulence that we were experiencing, again, speaking from my own experience, came from the recounting of our executive student stories of the era of widespread social and industrial conflict. This had, of course, invaded not only the industrial workplace, but the lecture theatres and corridors of many universities, including the LSE, which I had so recently left. Increasingly, these social movements challenge the legitimacy of formal organizational structure, of management authority, and even of the wider institutional context. By contrast, the internal turbulence I experienced in crossing the backyard of the LBS to join the research meetings was produced by the anticipation of fiercely heated debates around the processing and interpretation of survey data. These often led to fundamental challenges to their objective validity, to the usage of the chosen statistical techniques, to the interpretation of results, and even to the representativeness of the items making up the still quite huge Aston interview schedules. These debates engage strong scholarly commitments from each side of the argument, which occasionally spilt over onto the pages of the ASQ. This London-based stage of the Aston program had brought together a new team of research fellows. Each one had responsibility for a specialized application of the project, but all were expected to comment on the work of the whole as well as John Child, Roy Payne, and Will McQuillan, veterans of the earlier Aston generation, they now included Roger Mansfield, Malcolm Warner, Lex Donaldson, Alan Dale, and Les Madcalf, um, and a number of other researchers, research assistants. Not only was the variety of the program's applications being extended, but a new team appeared to be probing both its agenda and its rules of engagement. On my train journeys to and from work, I read Alvin Gulner's latest appeal for a more reflexive social science. This was dramatically entitled The Coming Crisis of Western Sociology. It very often calls me to reflect on the ideational distance I was covering in traversing the backyard of the LBS. Derek has been frank in recording the 1970s as a period that presented new challenges in all areas of his professional life. David Hickson and Bob Hynings had also left Aston for a short stay in Alberta before returning to Bradford and Birmingham universities respectively. Bob was to return to Alberta permanently with Royston Greenwood in 1983. Lex Donaldson left LBS for the University of New South Wales in 1977 to pursue a goal initially shared with Derek of measuring temporal organizational change by means of st statistical modeling. Early in 1983, Derek himself declared LBS to be in a rut and left for new challenges he saw to be offered by the Open University. On the other hand, the 1970s 
was also the decade in which the comparative replications and applications of the Aston program measured blossomed internationally. This seemed a clear indication of their recognized efficacy, not only in exploring endogenous structuring, but also in exploring the causal effects of organizational structure on its context. The range of studies in, in, in both comparisons across sectors and nations <coughs> and the vertical analysis of their hierarchical roles and groups as well as that of organizational climate proliferated. However, it soon became clear and was later apparent in the authorized collections of the Aston Program papers that these studies adopted a broader theoretical approach to their data than had previously been the case. For example, John Chard's 1972 strategic choice article in the journal Sociology saw environmental contingency as cognitively shaped by the mobilizing processes of internal strategic coalitions. The phenomenal citation level of Child's article provided an early indication of a wider movement towards the adoption of a socially constructive analytical frame in management and organizational scholarship. By the end of the decade, <laughs> Burrell and Morgan could already identify and categorize a plurality of analytical par paradigms used by writers in the field. Also in 1979, Henry Mintzberg saw the Aston dimensions as indicative of centrifugal forces, these forces driving apart the five functionally and ideationally specialized segments of large organizations rather than tying them together. From their new base in Alberta, Bob Hynings and Royston Greenwood also pursued an intellectual path that had led them to interpret organizational structure as ideational archetype. Derek himself employed the Aston measures in the context of cultural contingency. Once he explained to me that it was Gert Hofstetter's famous categorization of nationally disparate management values that had made it possible for him to do so. His later best-selling Penguin text, Management Worldwide, written with David Hickson, seemed to confirm the popularity of this view. John Child and I went to Aston University in late 1973 with Peter Clark, another pioneer user of the program's measures. We gained an ESRC grant to form the Work Organization Research Center. Over its relatively short existence between 1984 and 1992, it provided a shared platform for the early research of inter alia Richard Whipp, Ken Starkey, Alan McKinley, Chris Smith, Mick Rowlinson, Steve Gaw Stephen Gawley, Neil Staunton, and other colleagues pursuing related projects. Our shared work perspective might be seen as a case-based historical approach to technological and strategic innovation. It owed much to Peter Clark's theoretical inputs. Across the variety of our theoretical paths, we have all traveled since then. It seemed apparent that colleagues in this later Aston program have also made distinguished contributions to a growing field of management theory and scholarship that Derek envisaged so prophetically in his early career. Derek's own response, then and later, to the proliferation of different perspectives on his life project was typically tolerant and open-minded. At the same time, he vigorously defended functional realism and positivistic reasoning in his own analytical position. For me, his greatest achievement was that of stimulating a much broader intellectual space than had previously existed in management and organization research. This space has enabled the critical examination of the relationship, both symbolic and material, between attempted strategies and structures of organizational elites 
and of the global context shaping and being shaped by their decisions. In conclusion, Derek's rigorous pursuit of sustainable evidence-supported argument still seems very worthwhile to me. So is the value he placed on programmed research with long-term goals, employing researchers with complementary skills and objectives. Both may yet prevail in the context of what often appears as the ebbing and flowing of fashionable floating signifiers and pop-up organizational fields. I shall still best remember Derek for the intensity of his devotion to an understanding of his subject and a personal concern for those whose companionship <coughs> Sorry. he valued along a shared vocational journey. I really am going to struggle to follow um, our previous speaker, who I think has superbly put the Aston studies in um, a much broader context and, and history. But here goes. I'm just going to be a lot of overlap inevitably. So we really are remembering today one of the OB field's great leaders. Um, I think... Um, what the achievements of the Aston Group demonstrate to all of us is what can happen when people take courageous, visionary risks, um, which is what Derek did. Um, in the late 50s, he left um, the comfort of Edinburgh University, uh, which was, um, you know, he was nicely set up there, and he moved to... Birmingham College of Technology, and um, he saw a vision and an opportunity, um, which eventually, of course, became an advanced college and then Aston University. Um, and I think there were some enabling conditions that, that came together um, that meant he was able to, to seize the moment. Not least, um, he met his um, beloved wife, Natalie, who was herself a sociologist. Derek's training was in psychology, but Derek was no respecter of disciplinary boundaries any more than he was a respecter of institutional hierarchies. What mattered was he saw the vision, he saw the opportunity, he saw the resource enabling conditions coming together, and he seized the moment. And great things followed um, as a result of that. So between 1960 one and 1968 um, when Derek left Aston to go to London Business School he really did assemble fantastic teams and one success became the foundation for the next success became the foundation for the next success which as we've just heard he replicated four times over so four generations of researchers really put Aston University and management research, organization theory in particular, on the map coming out of Britain. And it's one of our best achievements of all time, in my opinion. Um, and it's an opinion I know is shared by many others. So I think um, what's interesting is it demonstrates what can happen through collective effort. This really was a team effort. It wasn't Derek on his own. He created the enabling conditions for others to flourish and people who came through that era had a great training and they learned from, from one of the field's greats. Um, but it really was a collective effort. So what happened um, in the early years at Aston, the, the key vision was to develop reliable and valid, as Derek saw them, objective measures of organizational structural reality. He was unashamedly, as we've just heard, a realist, a positivist, and he was unrepentant about that right up to the end of his career and beyond, as he stated repeatedly in autobiographical essays and various speeches and publications. So 
the key vision in the early days was to create measures of structure, five famous dimensions, which it's no accident Henry Mintzberg went on to write structure in fives. There were five dimensions from Aston. Specialization, standardization, formalization, centralization, and configuration. And I think it's fair to say that at the very beginning of the Aston studies, Derek saw structure as pretty well driving everything else that follows. So he was strongly a determinist in that sense. Structure, of course, was dependent on context, but it was structure that ultimately drove performance and then had downward effects at group levels and, latterly, individual levels. But the early Aston work was really about creating the measures to be able to um, quantify structural similarities and differences between organisations Later work, um, particularly at London Business School with people like Roy Payne, looked at the relationship between structure and climate. And then latterly at the individual level, Roy went on to look at the effects on personal stress of organisational characteristics. Other people um, looked at things like bureaucratic personalities. At Bradford, my former, Chris, my former um, Leeds colleague Chris Allinson's PhD thesis looked at the bureaucratic personality, for example. So the key about Derek then, he was unashamedly deterministic, positivistic, and he, what he did for the field was to take structure seriously and put structure back on the map. It's interesting to reflect on that now. There's been a huge movement towards behavioral science, particularly at Warwick, I'm head of the behavioral science group there, where structure is underrepresented, I think, structural effects, contextual effects need to be brought to bear on the analysis of individual behavior. I worry we've, we've moved too far in the other direction of late. Developments in neuroscience are showing fantastic insights into human behavior, but we have to marry these latest developments with reminds us from this important earlier work, just how important that context and structure are in shaping and limiting what's humanly possible. Yet at the same time, structures are not immutable. It's important we don't fall into the equal trap of, of reification. Um, in the end, structures are humanly created. And it's this interplay between structure and agency that later generations of, of scholars have, have taken on. Um, in, in the later work. I think it's also important to remember that when this fantastic work was being done in the early 1960s, factor analysis was even more of a dark art than it is now. Um, in the, the click of a button now, you can produce statistical results in nanoseconds that used to take three, four, five, six days of work. SPSS, even when I started my career, was a nightmare. In those early days, how did you um, do factor extractions and rotate to simple structure? Well, for starters, you typically did hand calculations of communalities and eigenvectors, and then you took a set square, a protractor, a compass. You had huge sheets of graph paper, you physically hand plotted these things. You then, with tracing paper, having determined where the vectors lay, rotated by hand to simple structure, having computed the angular separation between the vectors. This was days and days of work. It predated SPSS as we know it, predated Windows. There was no such thing in those early days as multi level modeling. Multi level modeling combines the insights of structural equation modeling at one level of analysis with the ability to do regressions at different levels of analysis and study cross-level effects. Those techniques did not exist. They hadn't been invented. Harvey Goldstein at the Institute of Education came along much later and developed those techniques. But if you look carefully through the Aston literature, people like John Child were already comparing regression slopes across different levels of analysis or between different groups, which is what 
multi, modern day multi-level modeling does. There was no such thing as multivariate analysis of variance. It hadn't yet been invented. We were still in the days of doing multiple univariate comparisons for many things we now take for granted hadn't been invented. But Derek was a fellow, of course, of the Royal Statistical Society. And what he was really doing was using the techniques that were available, such as they were, to really push the frontiers of application in organization science, as we now call it. I think that's a remarkable achievement that's been massively, massively understated in the literature. Of course, equally, he was very modest in the inferences he was prepared to draw from the analyses he undertook. Quite a contrast with many current scholars who get fairly small effects and then make vast claims way beyond the capabilities of the data. So let's just reflect for a minute on the big six articles, as I'll call them, that appeared in ASQ, um, 1968, um, Pew, Hicks, and Heinings et al., Dimensions of Structure. So this is the paper that put the five dimensions out there that I mentioned earlier. 702 Web of Science citations as of Sunday, and 2014 Google Scholar citations. I think that those statistics speak for themselves. Um, second paper to follow, Pew, Hicks and Heinings et al, 1969a. Context of structures, 563 Web of Science citations, one paper, and 1,231 Google Scholar, Scholar citations. I could go on and on in this vein through all six, but it's amazing. Um, and what I believe happened is ASQ was still a relatively fledgling journal. It was 13 years old at that stage. I think the Aston Group benefited ASQ as much as ASQ. It was a symbiosis between excellent scholarship coming out of the UK and a journal that was of its time ripe for going up to the next level. And equally remarkable um, is that when um, John Freeman took over as editor in um, several years later, um, in the 1980s, I think, he um, mentions three major pieces of work that exemplify what ASQ is all about. The Hawthorne Studies, the American Soldier Studies, and the Aston Studies, all in the same sentence. And that thrilled Derek. I think the Aston Studies really went way beyond Derek's wildest imagination. When, when he started that journey, he couldn't possibly have realized where, where this journey was going to um, continue and, and, and end. Um, so today, there have been critiques of, of the Aston studies and detailed interchanges. One of the most interesting and colorful I've read um, in preparing for today was um, there's a, an edited volume which was edited by Andrew Van de Ven and um, Joyce, William Joyce, in 1981. And if you really want an insightful critique and rebuttal of the critique, then um, I can do little better than commend that to you. So Derek himself wrote a chapter. Bill Starbuck did a critique, and then um, Derek responded um, unashamedly, unapologetic for the achievements of what the group had done. Yes, we can pick holes now in hindsight in some of the things that went on in terms of um, the effects of rotations and extraction methods and methodological choices, but I stand by what I said. I think in its context at the time, given the relative immaturity of the techniques that were being used, um, it, was, it was fantastic work. So today, I simply want to highlight um, this absolutely marvelous set of achievements and what went beyond it and help us to remember and reflect on one of the field's greats. So um, if we just think briefly about what did follow post Aston, we've got institutional theory, Heinings and Greenwood. Royston Greenwood was a part-time PhD student of Bob Heinings at the University of Birmingham. Bob left Aston, went to Birmingham, took a lectureship there. Royston was a government officer. 
having completed his PhD, of course, they went on to do great things with institutional theory over in Alberta, as we've just heard. Internationalization, decision processes, and choice, Child and Hickson. Great bodies of work, the Bradford studies, the strategic choice theory work, the internationalization work that John's done, tremendous. Structure and climate pain, and then occupational stress. Roy was a close colleague of mine for many years at the University of Sheffield. We first met when I had a brief period at Manchester Business School. Um, and again, Roy was very much a product of the Aston mentoring process. Roy followed to LBS from Aston, and then from LBS he went to the, what became the Institute of Work Psychology at the University of Sheffield. Among many others, we've heard Lex, Lex Donaldson, Roger Mansfield, Malcolm Warner, etc., etc. Also, let's not forget that many of these people went on to key leadership positions, either in the academy or institutionally. You know, and um, of course, David Hickson went on to found organisation studies. Ray himself edited Human Relations for many years. Um, Roger Mansfield went on to be dean at Cardiff. So people played key roles. Derek himself, though, recognised when things had come of the time. And in 1968, when the opportunity arose to move on to pastures new and pursue new challenges and opportunities at London, he went and did that. And then, having done many marvellous things at London, where he, of course, was... Um, I think the first professor of OB and, and head of group um, and developed and nurtured the group at London Business School beyond his own research remit. Um, he then saw it was time to move on again and the rest of his career was at the Open University and there he did many other marvellous things helping to put the Open University Business School on the map and institutionally within the wider profession he played lots of key roles, not least here in BAM, where he had a massive heart for um, doctoral students. And year after year, he came to this conference and took part extensively in the doctoral programme. He was there mentoring doctoral students, sitting there in his quietly understated way. How am I doing for time, Cathy? Can I really? So, I think the thing to... Remember is this, Derek took the cards he had and he really made fantastic things happen with the cards he had. He was able to spin out resources, create synergies that were um, truly remarkable. And he took on new challenge after new challenge. He didn't seek personal glory. He didn't do these things for personal gratification. Much of Derek's leadership was from the back, actually. So he would sit quietly and enable things to happen. He wasn't there in the front, look at me, look at me. He was very much in the background, quietly nurturing, gently persuading, dropping thoughts and ideas into people's minds. And they would, you know, cognitive processes being what they are, they would take a life of their own. And great things happened. I think... Um, a truly remarkable individual. Um, so he saw the enabling conditions and also created them. Time and space, financial resources, supportive management structures. I believe that's what drove him to go to Birmingham. And combined with self-belief and clear values and a sense of community. And another of the great enabling conditions, I believe, was his, his dear wife, Natalie. So I'm going to end with three personal anecdotes which may explain why I'm standing here today when so many other people would have been much better qualified, I think, to say some of the things that I've, I've said. So, um, first encounter with Derek Pugh was at um, Manchester Metropolitan University. This is my first personal encounter. I encountered him many years earlier as an undergraduate when I read Writers on Organisation, one of the editions of that, and um, the Payne and Pew handbook chapter. Um, so Richard Thorpe actually um, asked me, would I go to Manchester Metropolitan University to the doctoral conference symposium, whatever it was that Richard had organised, and talk about how to build 
a publication career, a successful publication career. This was still fairly early days for me as a young professor, and I felt greatly humbled that I'd been asked to do that. And as I was preparing my talk, I was thinking, what's the best example I can think of? Um, it's the Aston Group, and what Derek did there was to create with teams six, seven great ASQ papers. From that came the later books and book chapters, because there is then something to put in the shop window. So book chapters are a great way of advertising your journal articles. He didn't do it the other way around. And the logic to that, I find, very compelling. Of course, while I was spouting forth this, this great view, sitting two rows back, roughly where Ray is now, I suddenly realized in horror, there was Derek. I saw his name badge, and I thought, oh gosh, um, I wonder what he's going to make of this. So I sat down at lunch, and finally, the hand of doom came on my shoulder, and I looked up, and there was Derek, and he approved. So um, that was good, and he was so generous with his comments and so encouraging for me at, at that stage in my career. Um, I saw firsthand um, how much he values um, younger colleagues and scholars. I really did. Um, about 18 months later, I was in London on a book buying spree, as I do from time to time. And I was in water, what's now Waterstones. I think it was Dylan's in those days at University College London. Great bookshop. And suddenly a voice said, Gerard. And I looked up, and there was Derek. And he was buying some history books. He'd now retired, and he was, his passion was becoming history. And we got talking, and then suddenly he said, gosh, I've got to get back. Um, Natalie's at home, she'll need me. And I saw firsthand the, the devotion and the love he had for Natalie, for your mum. And that was tremendous. And I realized, you know, that must have been a tremendous support and force behind these marvelous achievements. And then the third story is Derek related. 30 years ago, roughly, I was on my way to a British Psychological Society conference at the University of Leeds. I just pulled into the car park, and a car pulled in next to me. And out came um, somebody I didn't know, um, and we struck up a conversation. It was a lady, and I, I just said, are you by any chance going to the conference? She said, yes, I am, as a matter of fact. And we started to talk, and I said how I was, somehow it got on to who was I, where was I, what was I doing. And I, said, and I explained that I was at a crossroads, and I was thinking about doing a PhD, but I wasn't really sure if that was the right move for me at that time. In those days, you could be a lecturer without a PhD. Imagine that now. And I explained what I was thinking of doing as the topic. And then, after about 15 minutes, we'd now arrived at the check-in desk. She said, you know, I really do think you should do a PhD. And I've written a book with a colleague, Derek Pugh, um, How to Get a PhD. And I'd like you to have a copy of it. Here it is. And um, of course, you'll now realize that was Estelle. So I think that's the perfect time to end. I'd like to mention that exactly two weeks ago today, I was at the memorial service that his family put on for Derek. And I feel very privileged to be involved in both the personal and professional tributes that are paid to my longtime friend and colleague. So I wanted to say that. Now we go back to the beginning because um, we were very often asked, how was it that you two got together? How, you know, where did it all start? And we would just smile and keep quiet. So today I'm revealing a lot of secrets. I originally met Derek in Canada at a conference on the quality of working life. It was in 1982, over 30 years ago, and I was speaking about women in work, and he was giving a very controversial paper on different styles of management. There are very few people there from Britain. It was a heavily North American um, conference. Um, I remember there was a small contingent from the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations including Frank Heller and Don Bryant. And then there were some individuals from different universities from the UK, like Derek and me. So in the first instance, it was our accents rather than our research that brought us together. At that time, I was about 
three quarters of the way through the final draft of my own thesis called the PhD as a learning process. And a few months later, Derek became my external examiner. At the end of my four-hour-long viva, and in the book we say it should never be longer than three hours, um, I emerged exhausted but triumphant, and I did hear him say that it had to be rewritten as a book, that the public, um, uh, that it had to be made public, it shouldn't just be put away on a library shelf. But instead, I turned to my research on the implementation of the Equal Opportunities Act. We didn't meet again until three years later, when in 1985 I was working at the Open University and Derek was thinking of making the move from the London Business School and um, our paths crossed again. He asked about the non-existent book. He was very disappointed when I told him that absolutely nothing had happened. I hadn't done anything about it whatsoever. And he suggested writing it himself with full acknowledgement to me and my work, because in those years he had not changed his mind. It was something that needed to be made public, and if I wasn't going to do it, then he would. I had a sleepless night. The next morning I phoned him at the business school, and I told him that I wasn't happy with his suggestion, and I didn't really want him to use all my research and my work. And he said, oh, I thought you might come to that conclusion, what do you think about us working together on it? The rest, as they say, is history. From the start, we argued about everything. Derek and I agreed on practically nothing. Writing together was an enjoyable battle, a stimulating seminar or tutorial going both ways. There was no doubt that we sparked off of each other. The process was intellectually enjoyable, but emotionally draining. Derek's favourite phrase to me was, where's your evidence? And mine to him was, you always think you're right. But we both agreed it was a much, much better book than it would ever have been if either one of us had written it alone. Every concept, every word, even punctuation, was argued over, and when neither of us could persuade the other, because most of the time one or other of us won this, these arguments, we've stated both opinions, because one thing that we did agree on was that it was good for students to become aware that even successful academics and authors could live comfortably with disagreement. And there are pieces in the book where you'll say, DSP thinks this and EMP thinks that, and you have to make up your own mind. I can't believe it's now in its sixth edition, the sixth edition which I brought with me, and I've got a couple, if anybody wants to buy them at a reduced price, uh, um, came out just three weeks ago. Um, and in the time since we started to write it, and um, now, uh, the first edition came out in 1987, the changes in um, doctoral education are phenomenal. At that time, even senior professors who'd been supervising PhDs for years didn't understand the question, how do you conceptualise your role as a supervisor? There was no role as a supervisor. Supervision was something you did out of the goodness of your heart. It was at the bottom of your list of priorities. And I had to rephrase the question in order for people, um, experienced academics, to understand what I was trying to get at. After the publication of the second edition, we were told that we had given students a tool with which to whip their supervisors, or as Derek would say, a tool to whip them with. We never agreed on the citing of prepositions, and that continues to the last edition, to the, to the latest edition. Just a few of the things that have changed in the area of doctor research and supervision since we first started writing include annual assessments. There was no regular progress reports for students. They would register for a research degree and somewhere towards the end they would, tell, they would be told whether they could upgrade the registration from MPhil to PhD or not. And now, of course, we have regular monitoring, which we um, insisted on at the very beginning. 
We now have the supervisor as an observer, not as an ex internal examiner at the Viva. And the, there is the introduction, um, well established now, of a supervisory team instead of just one-to-one -one supervision. Importantly, um, we made public the whole concept of originality because it was clear to us that this was what terrified research students the most. They would get their degree for an original thesis, but they didn't know what originality was or whether they were original enough or how original they had to be. And they didn't actually find out until after they had failed or gained their PhD. And we have now made it very clear um, the very little step you have to take in order to be considered original. You don't have to take a giant stride. I want to mention, as I said before I started, the changes in technology which affected our interactions and the process of the actual writing of the different editions of the book. When we started work on the first edition, we both had typewriters. Um, we met primarily at Derek's home, and Natalie, his lovely wife, provided us with lunch, and every now and then called us down for refreshments if she thought the arguments were getting a bit too loud. By the time we began the second edition, we both had computers, but we weren't very confident of how to use them. Excuse me. The third edition saw us using email to work on each other's drafts, and we sometimes met at my house instead of his. Because of Natalie's failing health, the fourth and fifth editions were firmly in my home where we did get together, but most of the work was done electronically. With this latest edition, <laughs> we worked almost completely over Skype. Whenever we were stumped by how to proceed practically, our new colleague, Dr. Colin Johnson, an asset to two technologically challenged academics, as he is based in the School of Computing in Kent University, would do it for us. We have now handed the baton over to him, and having worked with both Derek and myself on this latest edition, he will be taking over if the book ever goes into a seventh edition in the future. Technology affected um, the way we edited the book as well, because um, our preliminary sorting used to be that we would cut things out. We, we would ask for extra books, and then we cut them to pieces uh, from the previous edition and um, type up what new information we wanted. We had papers all over the dining room table and the kitchen floor and um, crawling about with uh, sellotape and scissors sticking things together. But, of course, now we have... Um, computers, laptops, my iPad, and we just move the text around. It's quite different experience. Technology affected the research as well, because at first we used to go to universities and talk to doctoral students, to academics, to administrators, to find out what was actually going on so that we would be right up to date with the latest um, book that we were writing. And we wanted to know what were the relevant issues at the time. But then, once again, technology raised its ugly but extremely useful head, and we did our interviews by email. And we gathered statistics and more official information by looking up websites. So it's really changed dramatically. And we ourselves were changing. We were growing older, maturing, and um, with an eye to the future and the agreement of our publishers, we recruited Colin. Our editor said that Derek and I were the longest writing partnership she knew in publishing. The others all get fed up with each other and split, she said. I told her that it had lasted twice as long as my marriage. <laughs> the book itself has influenced the field of doctoral research and supervision beyond anything we could have ever dreamed of all those years ago. Both Derek and I have travelled extensively and expensively um, speaking at universities in this country and abroad to students and to supervisors in all disciplines about the topics we cover in How to Get a PhD. Ours was the first book in this area, but now it's almost a discipline in itself with the growth and extensive coverage of every aspect of the PhD from our own and other publishers. Publishers, I might say, who originally turned down our idea 
of a whole book dedicated to just that tough topic because they said that it couldn't fill a whole book. And now, of course, we've got whole books on the Viva and on um, the thesis, etc. So people were thinking differently to the way Derek and I were looking at it at that time. The book's been translated into eight languages, almost all of them with a different alphabet, like um, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Arabic, and such like. Um, but the 2015 edition of How to Get a PhD still has the um, popular chapters, um, and we know because before we do a new edition, our publishers send out the book uh, for comments to various uh, academics and then gives us the, uh, the reports of what they think is out of date or what they think is irrelevant and what they particularly like. And we know that um, they really like um, how to manage your supervisor and how not to get a PhD. The sixth edition has new material on how PhD students can make use of the latest information technology, such as online forums. That's Derek. I would prefer fora. Uh, and survey tools, and was written rather differently to the previous editions. Derek was aware that he was very ill. He was determined to do as much as he could for as long as he could. He started writing earlier than me, and worked very quickly, returning drafts of sections he was working on as soon as I had commented on them, leaving very little time for me to do my own new drafts. His output was almost frenzied. I told him that I felt we were not working equally, and he explained that he knew it would not be long before he was unable to continue, so he needed to get out all the new bits he considered important, at least in first draft, so I would be able to work on them later. I'm going to have a bit of difficulty with this bit. He also said that he knew I didn't want to rush my own bits, but if there were some sections where I thought I needed his input more than others, I should get to them to him as early as possible. I didn't find this fatalistic attitude easy to cope with, but Derek had planned well, and it was not long before he was too tired and lacking in energy to continue. Here, our new co-author, Dr. Colin Johnson, became invaluable. He's written some new sections, including practical advice and tips for writing proposals and applying for funding, as well as reading everything I sent him of my own and Derek's work. The How to Survive chapters have been replaced by a new Challenges chapter, which now includes practical advice for tackling prejudice and dealing with the pressures that can face early career researchers. There's expanded material on avoiding plagiarism and poor academic practice and increased coverage of issues faced by part-time PhDs. A word about the covers, because with every new edition, the covers of our books changed. And we were fortunate that our publishers consulted us and included our opinions in their decision-making. After what I've been saying, you may be surprised to hear that Derek and I always agreed on the artwork. There was never any disagreement about that. And, um, for example, one of the more crazy ideas where it came from that we were presented with was that the study skills series of our publishers should have an immediately recognisable feature on the cover so that anyone looking would know that it was part of the study skills series. We were presented with a white cover, How to Get a PhD, Phillips and Pew, and plump in the middle, a most luscious, delicious-looking strawberry. Derek and I both said that we were neither a cookery book nor a book of desserts, and we would never, ever agree to having a strawberry or any other fruit, for that matter, as a cover for How to Get a PhD. We didn't care what was going on with the rest of the series, under no circumstances would we ever agree to a strawberry. And when Derek and I agreed and forcefully um, presented our combined disagreement to other people, you really couldn't do very much about it. Um, the cover was agreed with no hint of a, a strawberry or any other fruit, and it was a cover that was relevant to the content of the book. While I'm talking about artwork, I'd like to say how generous Derek was. Um, he was very thoughtful, and every, every now and then he would give me a framed copy of 
one of the um, covers of the book, the artwork that we'd worked together on to get what we wanted. And I've got a couple of them hanging in my house. And in fact, the first gift he ever gave me, and it wasn't for a birthday, he just gave it to me to celebrate, was a framed copy of the, an original cartoon that was featured in the Times Higher Ed, um, illustrating an article based on the first edition of How to Get a PhD. He was the driving force in getting new editions out. He always wanted to do the work. He wanted to bring it up to date. I didn't ever want to do that, and uh, it took a long time for him to persuade me, but obviously, with six editions, he always won that argument. Um, I only agreed to do this latest edition after both Derek and our publishers had promised to recruit a new additional author with a view to the future. But it was me there that was very insistent, because Derek would have gone ahead if the publishers had said no to that. I feel very privileged to have spent much of my professional life working closely with a very special person. Over the years, our families have got to know and appreciate each other, and our sons are friends. Coming towards the end now, when I went to visit Derek in the hospice, I'd never been to a hospice before, and I didn't know what to expect. I braced myself not to show anything in my face because I expected him to look different from the Derek I knew. I carefully composed my expression and kind of practiced keeping that expression. Satisfied that I could keep control of my features, I walked into his room. His greeting? I looked worse yesterday. Seems I couldn't hide very much from him. When he was home again, he was very weak, but I had promised not to send the new edition to the publishers before he'd read it all as a whole. And this he did when he had the strength, while he was in bed, um, reading it on a laptop. His son told me that just a few days before he died, he seemed to have a little more energy. It was a lovely day, and they suggested that they get him into his wheelchair and take him for a short walk, where he could um, use his strength on this uh, beautiful winter's afternoon. And he said that if he was strong enough to be in the wheelchair and go outside, then he was strong enough to use the wheelchair to go to his study and do the final tweaks needed for the new edition. And that is what he did. The acknowledgments um, to our, our books were always Derek's job. I have never written acknowledgments, and I still haven't, actually. Um, and once the acknowledgments were written, the book was sent to the publishers, so that Derek never wrote the uh, acknowledgments, which, of course, we discussed and agreed who had to go in and who had to come out from the previous edition. But um, once we'd agreed what they were going to be, he left them aside and never would do them until we both thought that the book really was finished. So they were done at the very end. And um, in one edition, he thanked me for supplying refreshments, and I didn't know he'd done that until I received the first published copy um, from, the, from the publishers. So I really didn't have very much to do with the acknowledgments. Never having written them, I was actually feeling very anxious because it was very close to what we now know was the end. I knew that Derek was um, unable to do very much, and I was pretty sure that I would have to handle the acknowledgments. Now, it sounds a bit um, overreacting, but because this was the sixth edition, and I had never done them before in this book, although I have written acknowledgments in my life, I thought, suppose I leave somebody in that should have come out because it was um, last time, and this time we didn't have anything to do with them. Or worse, suppose I leave somebody out who we've consulted for the first time, and I forgot about them. Anyway, need I tell you, Derek wrote the acknowledgments. It was one of the last things he did. And when I said, oh my goodness, what a relief. I didn't think you were going to do them this time. He said, you didn't really think I'd leave the acknowledgments to you, did you? <laughs> After that, it was almost as though having used his energy and motivation to get to the end of what he had started, he was satisfied to give up. The new edition has been published, and it was very strange to me that for the first time, Derek and I 
didn't celebrate together. We always um, shared a glass or a bottle of wine or went out for a meal in the early days with Natalie, later just the two of us. And this time, it was a lonely and bittersweet experience. Derek always insisted on our taking a cab so that we could drink as much as we wished. And among the many things I learned from him was how to appreciate the finer points of good wine. He also taught me to be very attentive to detail, to negotiate my arguments and stand up for my ideas, although I didn't always appreciate it at the time. A self-confessed workaholic, he was the consummate academic and professional to the end. With his flamboyant style of dress in his green velvet suit and cravat with matching pocket handkerchief, he was always proud to be conspicuous and was in every way one of those characters who stand out a true individual. That's it. <laughs>